Suddenly, U.S. Marshals pour in. They quickly take her into custody and escort her out, ending a five-week-long manhunt that riveted the nation. Uh, you're being held with no bond. Reese is set to be extradited to Fort Myers, Florida, later this week, where she will first face charges for the murder of her lookalike, 59-year-old Pamela Hutchinson. Prosecutors in Minnesota say they are also building a case against Reese for the shooting death of her husband, David. I don't know. You just do. I don't know. Are you still afraid? Yes. A grandmother describes the day she opened fire on her own grandson in her emotionally charged testimony. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Sandra Lane, a grandmother raising her grandson, first spoke of a respectful young man. Then she says things drastically changed when the 17-year-old turned to She spoke very quietly but broke down several times when she was asked about the night she killed Jonathan Hoffman. The case of Sandra Lane and Jonathan Hoffman is a tragic and chilling story that unfolded in West Bloomfield Township, Michigan. Sandra Lane, an elderly woman, shot and killed her own grandson, Jonathan Hoffman, in a horrifying incident that was captured by a 911 call. This event shocked the community and sparked legal investigations into what led up to a devastating turn of events. What could possibly lead a grandmother to take the life of her own grandson? Was it an accident, an act of revenge, or even self-defense? This is what the family members of both Sandra and Jonathan wanted to find out. Jonathan, a 17-year-old high school student, had been living with his grandma, Sandra, ever since his parents' divorce. Initially, it seemed like Jonathan moving into his grandmother's home was a really positive change. It gave him a chance to finish his final year of high school in a familiar environment. He also wouldn't have to choose which of his parents he wanted to live with. But as events unfolded, it became clear that tensions were brewing within the household. Like a lot of teenagers often do, Jonathan began experimenting with some addictive substances. The kind of substances that are illegal and could land him in a a lot of trouble. When Sandra found out, she made it clear that she wasn't going to stand for it. She claimed that Jonathan had been out of control, exhibiting aggressive and defiant behavior. She also believed that Jonathan wasn't just playing around with these illegal substances, but that he was addicted to them. She also alleged that Jonathan's behavior had become more and more problematic and that she was starting to fear for her own safety. She even decided to purchase a firearm for protection, but didn't tell anyone, even her husband, that she had made this decision. Decision. It would ultimately be that weapon that she would use to take Jonathan's life during a very heated moment. On the day of the shooting, Jonathan made a frantic 911 call, saying that his grandmother had fired a weapon at him. He pleaded for help as he described this horrific situation to the dispatcher. Despite Jonathan's desperate pleas, his grandma ended up firing at him several more times, killing him. This is that 911 call that captures the last moments of this teen's life. 911, what's your emergency? Help us, now we all know that there are probably not too many people calling 911 to report killer grandmas, so we can only imagine the shock that the dispatcher must have had when Jonathan tells her who the person is that brutally wounded him. But what's even more disturbing is the fact that we are hearing this teenager taking his last breaths, and he knows it. I'm gonna die. Help. Okay, we're gonna have to stay on the phone with me, okay, sir? I'm gonna get help on the way. I'm gonna get help on the way, okay? <laughs> I'm, 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 where were you shot at? Where are you shot? Your chest? Okay, who, who, are your grandparents still there? No. Where do they go? 
I don't know. While at this point, Jonathan believes that his grandmother has left the scene, she comes back just a short time later, and that's when she finishes him off. The paramedics soon arrive, but at that point, it is too late to save Jonathan's life. When law enforcement arrived at the scene, Sandra claimed self-defense, but all the evidence suggested otherwise. Toxicology reports revealed that while there were signs that Jonathan had used illegal substances previously because they were in his urine, he was not influenced by them at the time of the incident. This contradicted Sandra's claims that he had been under the influence at the time. But that's not all. Sandra's actions leading up to the incident, such as purchasing a weapon and ammunition, show that this was likely premeditated, and not some sort of self-defense that happened in the heat of the moment. Sandra would later be arrested and charged in connection with the death of her own grandson. The trial against Sandra was dramatic and heavily discussed. Whose side are family members supposed to be on? The 75-year-old woman or the teenager who is now deceased? Witness testimonies painted Jonathan as a beloved and bright young man. The picture that everyone painted of him was completely different from Sandra's portrayal of him as a trouble and aggressive teenager. Jonathan's friends and family described him as intelligent, funny, and caring. He was not known as a violent person who would have attacked someone. During the trial, Sandra testified on her own behalf and explained how this all supposedly went down. Is this the first time we've seen that kind of emotion out of Sandra Lane? Yes, Stephen and Carolyn, and she was on the stand for about two and a half hours today. She talked about the day of the shooting. She said Jonathan failed that test, did not want to go to jail, but wanted her car and $2,000 in cash. She said she was going to tell him no and armed herself to make sure he listened. So you're walking to the loft, and you, did you have a conversation with him? Yes. What kind of conversation? It wasn't a conversation. What? Forgive me. What is he saying to you? He's swearing. He's yelling. Does he tell you he's taking the car? Yes. Is he kids? Sandra also alleged that it was Jonathan who got violent against her first and that she was afraid. Sandra Lane says her grandson, 17-year-old Jonathan, then kicked her in the chest. Where did he kick you? <laughs> Here. Did he strike you? In the head. Sorry? In the head. In the head area? And what happens? Tell us what happens when he kicks you with strikes you. It's important to remember that Jonathan called 911 after the first time his grandma fired at him. He was begging for help and believed he was dying. But for some reason, Sandra tries to suggest that she still believed that he was a threat to her, even a big enough threat that she decided to continue to fire at him until he was dead. How many times did she to I don't know. What happens when you It's a struggle. What kind of struggle? He's running after me. And what are you doing? So clearly there are a few different things that aren't adding up here. She doesn't remember how many times the weapon went off. This could be understandable if you consider the many different emotions she was experiencing at this moment, but what she does next also doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The 75-year-old grandmother who never even told her husband she bought the gun says she and Jonathan were just running around the condo and then she went to the basement to hide. What are you trying to do? I get away. Stop him. So you're trying to get away from him. And why are you trying to get away from him? I'm scared. I'm scared. What are you scared about? He's gonna hurt me. Then Sandra Lane says she went back upstairs to Jonathan's loft. So she was hiding from Jonathan, who now we know is lying on the ground upstairs on the phone with 911 because she just fired at him. But then she decides to leave her hiding spot and go up and go after him again? He grabs from the picture. What do you do? I grab. Do you see? Do you see? Do you see? Do you see? Yeah. Yeah, remember yelling, let go, let go, let go? Yes. Do you shoot? Do you remember? Why are you shooting? I don't know. You just do. I don't know. Are you still afraid? 
Yes! If you don't know the details and you hadn't heard about the evidence or the facts of this case, you probably would find it hard to believe that this little old lady could have hurt anyone. Not only does she not look the part, but her background hardly suggests that she was ever a violent person. In fact, she had been a school teacher for many years. Some of the family members of those involved apparently had some pretty mixed feelings about who was to blame for this tragedy. A lot of Sandra Lane's family and Jonathan Hoffman's relatives are also in the court I'll tell you, Carolyn, there seems to be kind of two sides to, the, to these families right now. They seem to be in kind of factions, if you will. But it's hard to really gauge that because they're not really talking to reporters right now. They say they've been asked not to at this point. But Sandra Lane's husband is certainly in the courtroom. And, you know, this is a very emotional time for everybody. But everybody seems to be holding up pretty well, despite all the evidence that they've had to sit through. Ultimately, it was up to the jury to decide Sandra's fate. And in a decision that shocked many people across the nation, they convicted her of sexual second degree murder. While some people might not have believed that Sandra was truly guilty, Jonathan's parents definitely did, and they did not hold back when they told the press about how they felt regarding her conviction. I'm just glad that she's put away and she can't do harm to anybody else. How would you have described Sandra Lane before all this? Uh, she was always a thorn in my side, to be very honest. She was very difficult, um, uh, very meddlesome very controlling, and uh, I never liked her. Jonathan's parents wanted to see their son's killer spend as much time in prison as possible for what she did. The judge ended up agreeing and giving her the biggest sentence possible for second degree murder. Andrew Lane deserves the maximum penalty allowed. Please do not show mercy on her. The mother of Jonathan Hoffman got her wish. Sandra Lane will spend at least 20 years in prison for killing her grandson. So we know that because Sandra was already 75 years old at the time of all of this happened, unless she lives beyond 95 years old, it's pretty likely that she will die in prison and won't be free ever again. Sandra begged the judge to have mercy on her and not force her to spend the years that she had left in prison. I don't know what else to say. I just don't know. I didn't want to die in jail. Do you think that her sentence was too harsh or was it warranted given the circumstances? Let us know what you think in the comments. Tonight, a major break in a Greene County murder case seven months after a pregnant woman was found dead along the side of the road. This is the tragic story of Jessica Morrison, a young mother from rural Tennessee who was brutally murdered. There are a lot of shocking parts about this story, but nothing is quite as shocking as the truth about who killed her and how they reacted after being caught. This story begins one summer evening in 2018 in Knoxville. Jessica, who was just 21 years old at the time, had gone out walking through a wooded area as she did often. It was some much needed time alone that she got to enjoy while her two young boys were back at home in the care of her mother. Jessica knew this path well and wasn't supposed to be gone for long. But when she didn't return when she said she would, loved ones began to worry. That same day, a man named Donald Kahn Jr. was out walking his dog when they came across something horrific. It was the body of a young woman laying alongside the road. She had bruises and cuts all over her body and her clothing was torn. She appears to have major trauma to her head. Donald calls 911 and sadly, it is later confirmed by Jessica's mom that this was the body of her daughter. Who would have done this to her and why? Investigators find their first suspect in a very unexpected place, the grandmother of Jessica's children, Vonda Starr Smith. At first glance, Vonda seemed to have played the caring grandmother role, willing to lend Jessica a helpful hand when she needed it. But as law enforcement took a closer look at Vonda's activity, especially leading up to the murder, they found a lot of inconsistencies with her statements and actions. They found out that she was supposed to be the one babysitting the kids on the day of Jessica's disappearance and murder, but that she abruptly canceled. They also found out that there had been some conflict between her and Jessica about how often she would be allowed to see the two children. But let's first listen to her reaction to finding out that Jessica has been found dead. We need to talk to you for just a minute. Me? We got to, we got to use some information. What is it, honey? She's... 
And Jesse stay up. So obviously not a very dramatic reaction to finding out that the mother of her two beloved grandkids is dead. Is it possible that she could just be in shock? Maybe. But listen to the very first thing she says after getting this news. I did not say her. Vonda goes on to tell law enforcement all about how Jessica would regularly struggle to keep up with bills and that she would often give her a lot of money to help her with utilities. How much money would you give her to buy? Say thousands. I paid to have her lights turned on. They cut her lights off one day. I had to go get off from work. Go get the boys. They turned her lights off. How long did that be? It's all the time. She ran dirty for quite a bit. It wasn't that I cared, but I couldn't let those two boys or her do without. It wasn't that I cared, seems like a pretty strange thing to say about the mother of your two grandchildren. But it is starting to become more and more clear to law enforcement that Vonda and Jessica weren't always on the best terms, and disagreed over a lot of things, including how Jessica was choosing to raise her kids. We know that on the day that Jessica disappeared, Vonda claimed to have allowed Jessica to borrow her car so that she could go and pay some important bills. That was the last time she said she saw Jessica alive. Somehow Vonda's car was returned to her that same day, supposedly by Jessica, but Vonda never saw Jessica drop off the car. Investigators have a hunch that it wasn't Jessica that returned the car, but Vonda, who went to retrieve it and drive it back herself. So they asked her for permission to search the vehicle, and sure enough, it has recently been cleaned out using bleach. Vonda claims that her car had smelled like cat urine and that she had used the bleach to get rid of the smell. But law enforcement believe that she could have been trying to cover up something far more sinister. Upon closer examination of the car, they find evidence of stains in the car that the bleach didn't fully get rid of. They test the blood and it matches up to Jessica's DNA. This is the last piece of evidence that prosecutors need to go ahead and charge her with murder. Authorities in Greene County have charged Vonda Star Smith with two counts of first degree murder in the death of 21 year old Jesse Nicole Morrison and her unborn child. Morrison was found dead on the side of a Greene County road back in August of last year. Evidence against Vonda continues to build as the investigation progresses. The blood in her car, coupled with her conflicting accounts of her interactions with Jessica, has all made her look more and more guilty. Witness testimony about Vonda and her anger over not being able to see her grandkids enough paints a picture of a possible motive for the murder. The trial unfolds with the prosecution presenting a compelling case against Vonda. However, the defense claims claims that there simply wasn't enough concrete evidence to prove that Vonda did it. Vonda's DNA was never actually found at the murder scene, but that doesn't mean she wasn't there. So ultimately, despite the efforts by her defense to challenge the evidence, Vonda is convicted of Jessica Morrison's murder. She ends up being sentenced to life and even received extra years for how severe, cold, and calculated this murder was. She never showed any signs of remorse and was even seen smiling in the courtroom while she awaited her sentencing. Entering the courtroom with a smile on her face, Vonda Smith greeted her attorney and waited for her sentencing in the 2016 murder of Jesse Morrison. The judge laid into Vonda for betraying someone who trusted her the way that Jessica did. She trusted being with you as opposed to being with a stranger. Um, and bad things happen. This murder happened after that. While Jessica's family members were relieved to know that their daughter's killer was getting a life sentence, they acknowledged that nothing would ever be able to bring Jessica back. There's not enough justice on this earth. Where can you bring my daughter back? Or my grandchild? The judge decided Reese will be held without bond until her next court appearance within the week. Reese is accused of killing her husband in Minnesota before assuming the identity of lookalike Pamela Hutchinson from Florida and killing her as well. Reese, who was on the run from cops for two weeks, was later captured in Texas. She faces numerous charges, including homicide. It sounded like something out of a horror movie, but as hard as it may be to believe at first, this story actually happened. This is the story of Lois Reese, a seemingly sweet grandmother from Blooming Prairie, Minnesota. Lois led a double life that would shock her community and captivate national attention. The tale begins with Lois and her husband Dave, who were married for 35 years and ran a successful business together. Dave operated a bait and tackle shop while Lois ran a 
daycare out of their home. They were well-liked in their small community, known for their kindness and generosity. On the outside, Lois and Dave seemed to be your average, kind-hearted grandparents who couldn't hurt a soul. But Lois had a secret she didn't tell anyone about. She was deeply addicted to gambling. Now, you might be thinking a lot of older, retired couples enjoy going to casinos and betting some money. What's the big deal? Well, it's true frequenting casinos was one of Lois and Dave's favorite pastimes, but Lois would take gambling to a whole different level, a level that wasn't safe or healthy for anyone. She hid the level of her addiction to gambling from others. The obsession just continues to escalate more and more over the years. Lois began embezzling money from employees at her business and misusing funds meant for family matters. Her addiction spiraled out of control, eventually leading her to take drastic and deadly measures in an attempt to stay afloat. We can only speculate how much Dave knew about his wife's hidden addiction or what she was doing to get the money to keep gambling. While he may have been kept in the dark for a really long time, there are a lot of signs pointing to the likelihood that by the time that everything went down, he had finally learned the truth. Things take a turn in March of 2018 when Dave disappears without a trace, but he's not the only one. Lois is about to go missing as well. Concerned friends and family alerted the authorities when Dave failed to show up for work or respond to messages. The investigation took a grim turn when law enforcement arrived at Dave and Lois's house to begin their investigation and soon discovered Dave's decomposing body in their home. He had been twice with a .22 hand and Lois was nowhere to be found. That's because she was the one who killed him and she had already gone on the run. So Dave had just been murdered and Lois is missing. Obviously, she is looking like the clear number one person of interest in this case. Law enforcement are already thinking that it's possible that she killed her husband and fled. Now, they at least want to find her and talk to her about her version of events. But what Lois is actually out doing is probably the last thing that anyone would expect a sweet grandma like herself to be out doing. Apparently, Lois has seen way too many soap operas because she has concocted a majorly wild plan and is already busy carrying it out. Lois had fled to Fort Myers Beach, Florida, where she met and befriended another older woman named Pamela Hutchinson. Pamela happens to look eerily similar to Lois, and just wait until you find out why that is such an important detail. Lois has already planned to do away with Pamela so that she could take over her identity and continue to hide from law enforcement. In fact, she had specifically targeted Pamela for her looks, knowing that they looked so similar that it would be easy for her to pass as Pamela. So she gains Pamela's trust pretty easily. This isn't surprising. Lois is known for being friendly and easy to talk to, and she and Pamela were close in age. She and Pamela probably had no problem bonding over all the things they had in common. Check out this surveillance footage from a resort town in Texas that shows her laughing along with Pamela while the two enjoy drinks outdoors together. They're shown here at a Fort Myers bar. Police say Reese, on the right, befriended Hutchins. There was no way Pamela could have ever imagined that Lois was planning on using her in literally one of the most horrific ways imaginable. One night while visiting Pamela's condo, Lois decides that it's time to make her move. We know without a doubt that Lois was at Pamela's condo because she was captured on security footage there the same night that Pamela is ultimately killed. Lois ultimately uses the very same firearm that she used to kill Dave to murder Pamela. Pamela. Once the grisly task of getting Pamela out of the way is complete, Lois can finally move on to the next step, which is stealing her identity. But that's not all she steals. She decides to take Pamela's Acura too, and uses it as she flees across state lines. By this point, law enforcement are onto her. They have been able to follow her activity far better than she probably anticipated thanks to the help of video surveillance, and this sweet grandma is now wanted for two first-degree murders. Lois travels through Louisiana and in Texas, leading law enforcement on a manhunt. Meanwhile, people across the nation are watching this whole case unfold with shock. Lois managed to avoid law enforcement for a full month before she was finally captured and brought into custody. In other news, during more than a month on the run, all we saw of accused killer Lois Reese was grainy surveillance video. Now we're seeing the first video of her in court as the grandmother faces charges of killing her husband and a woman who looked just like her. It's first video of accused killer Granny Lois Reese appearing in court wearing a yellow tank top and shorts. It was the same outfit she wore when she was on the run. Watch as one of the most wanted women in America at the time was led into the courtroom for the first time. She appears calm and definitely doesn't look like a cold killer. You say something, it can't be used against the court as evidence. 
rights. You understand those rights, correct? Yes. We're also seeing the very moment Reese was taken into custody. Surveillance video shows her stepping into a restaurant in the resort town of San Pedro Island, Texas, last Thursday. Then she sits at the bar and orders a drink. She ate for more than an hour and sure looked like she was chatting with fellow diners. Let's take another look at that dramatic moment when Lois goes from enjoying a drink at the bar to being led away in handcuffs to face murder charges. It definitely doesn't seem like she saw it coming. Suddenly, U.S. Marshals pour in. They quickly take her into custody and escort her out, ending a five-week-long manhunt that riveted the nation. Oh, you're being held with no bond. Reese is set to be extradited to Fort Myers, Florida later this week where she will first face charges for the murder of her lookalike, 59-year-old Pamela Hutchinson. Prosecutors in Minnesota say they are also building a case against Reese for the shooting death of her husband, David. After being extradited to Minnesota and officially charged with the murders of both Pamela and David, Lois makes it clear that she is not going to cooperate and even refuses to take her own prescription medication. The accused grandma killer, Lois Reese, appears via closed circuit TV in a Florida courtroom for the first time since she was extradited back to the Fort Myers area. Prosecutors claim she is refusing to take her psychiatric medication. Because of all of this, the state asked the judge to consider giving her a very large bond, or no bond at all. Clearly, this was someone who is likely still going to be a major danger to the community. The judge decided to go with no bond at all. Initially, Lois seemed to think that she was going to be able to fight to prove her innocence. A Minnesota woman pleads not guilty to murdering her husband, Lois Reese made her first court appearance today since being extradited to Minnesota last week. She is accused of and killing her husband, David, at their Blooming Prairie home two years ago. But eventually, as the evidence against her continued to pile up, Lois changed her mind. She pleaded guilty, knowing that her plea would mean that she would be spending the rest of her life behind bars. After already accepting a life sentence for the murder of Pamela, Lois would end up pleading guilty to her husband's murder as well and receive a second life sentence. Ahead of the sentencing, Lois's defense attorney said that despite what many people following the chase believed, Lois was really sorry for what she had done and knew how badly she had hurt those closest to her. She claimed that she had been struggling with mental health issues for such a long time and had attempted to take her own life before in the past. She then apologized, quote, my life without David is my sentence. My heart will always be his. I should have never taken him from his children and grandchildren. And it was very hard for her. The allocution was very hard for her. She didn't want her children to know. Um, what had happened, but it was that was the truth, and so it had to be said. Lois also said that she hoped that others would learn from her story just how powerful gambling addictions can be. They can destroy lives in the same ways that drugs and alcohol are capable of doing. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.